Chapter 3 of Memories and Adventures by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by a fine voice. Chapter 3 Recollections of a Student Edinburgh University A Sad Disappointment Original of Professor Challenger Of Sherlock Holmes Deductions Sheffield Brighton, Birmingham, Literary Aspirations, First Accepted Story, My Father's Death, Mental Position, Spiritual Yearnings, An Awkward Business. When I returned to Edinburgh with little to show, either mental or spiritual, for my pleasant school year in Germany, I found that the family affairs were still as straightened as ever. No promotion had come to my father, and two younger children, Innes, my only brother, and Ida, had arrived to add to the calls upon my mother. Another sister, Julia, followed shortly afterwards, but Annette, the eldest sister, had already gone out to Portugal to earn and send home a fair salary, while Lottie and Connie were about to do the same. My mother had adopted the device of sharing a large house, which may have eased her in some ways, but was disastrous in others. Perhaps it was good for me that the times were hard, for I was wild, full-blooded, and a trifle reckless. But the situation called for energy and application, so that one was bound to try to meet it. My mother had been so splendid that we could not fail her. It had been determined that I should be a doctor, chiefly, I think, because Edinburgh was so famous a centre for medical learning. It meant another long effort for my mother, but she was very brave and ambitious where her children were concerned, and I was not only to have a medical education, but to take the university degree, which was a larger matter than a mere licence to practice. When I returned from Germany, I found that there was a long list of bursaries and scholarships open for competition. I had a month in which to brush up my classics, and then I went in for these, and was informed a week later that I had won the Grierson bursary, of forty pounds for two years. Great were the rejoicings, and all shadows seemed to be lifting. But on calling to get the money, I was informed that there had been a clerical error, and that this particular bursary was only open to art students. As there was a long list of prizes, I naturally supposed that I would get the next highest, which was available for medicals. The official pulled a long face and said, Unfortunately, the candidate to whom it was allotted has already drawn the money. It was manifest robbery, and yet I, who had won the prize and needed it so badly, never received it, and was eventually put off with a salatium of seven pounds, which had accumulated from some fund. It was a bitter disappointment, and of course I had a legal case, but what can a penniless student do, and what sort of college career would he have if he began it by suing his university for money? I was advised to accept the situation, and there seemed no prospect of accepting anything else. So now behold me, a tall, strongly framed, but half-formed young man, fairly entered upon my five years' course of medical study. It can be done with diligence in four years, but there came, as I shall show, a glorious interruption which held me back for one year. I entered as a student in October 1876, and I emerged as a Bachelor of Medicine in August 1881. Between these two points lies one long weary grind at botany, chemistry, anatomy, physiology, and a whole list of compulsory subjects, many of which have a very indirect bearing upon the art of curing. The whole system of teaching, as I look back upon it, seems far too oblique, and not nearly practical enough for the purpose in view. And yet Edinburgh is, I believe, more practical than most other colleges. It is practical, too, in its preparation for life, since there is none of the atmosphere in an enlarged public school, as is the case in English universities, but the student lives a free man in his own rooms, with no restrictions of any sort. It ruins some, and makes strong men of many. In my own case, of course, this did not apply, since my family lived in the town, and I worked from my own home. There was no attempt at friendship or even acquaintance between professors and students at Edinburgh. 
It was a strictly business arrangement by which you paid, for example, four guineas for anatomy lectures and received the winter course in exchange, never seeing your professor, save behind his desk, and never under any circumstances exchanging a word with him. They were remarkable men, however, some of these professors, and we managed to know them pretty well, without any personal acquaintance. There was kindly Crum Brown, the chemist, who sheltered himself carefully before exploding some mixture, which usually failed to ignite, so that the loud boom uttered by the class was the only resulting sound. Brown would emerge from his retreat with a really gentleman of remonstrance and go on without allusion to the abortive experiment. There was Wyville Thompson, the zoologist, fresh from his Challenger expedition, and Balfour, with the face and manner of John Knox, a hard, rugged old man who harried the students in their exams and was in consequence harried by them for the rest of the year. There was Turner, a fine anatomist, but a self-educated man, as was betrayed when he used to take and put this structure on the handle of this scalpel. The most human trait that I can recall of Turner was that upon one occasion the sacred quadrangle was invaded by snowballing roofs. His class, of whom I was one, heard the sounds of battle and fidgeted in their seats, on which the professor said, I think, gentlemen, your presence may be more useful outside than here, on which we flocked out with a whoop and soon had the quadrangle clear. Most vivid of all, however, there stands out in my memory the squat figure of Professor Rutherford, with his Assyrian beard, his prodigious voice, his enormous chest, and his singular manner. He fascinated and orders. I have endeavoured to reproduce some of his peculiarities in the fictitious character of Professor Challenger. He would sometimes start his lecture before he reached the classroom, so that we would hear a booming voice saying, there are valves in the veins, or some other information, when the desk was still empty. He was, I fear, a rather ruthless vivisector, and though I have always recognised that a minimum of painless vivisection is necessary, and far more justifiable than the eating of meat as a food, I am glad that the law was made more stringent, so as to restrain such men as he. Ah, these jarman frags, he would exclaim, in his curious accent, as he tore some poor amphibian to pieces. I wrote a student song, which is still sung, I understand, in which a curious article is picked up on the Portobello beach, and each professor in turn claims it for his department. Rutherford's verse ran, said Rutherford with a smile, it's a mass of solid bile, and I myself obtained it, what is more, by a stringent cholagog from a vivisected dog and I lost it on the Portobello shore. If the song is indeed still sung, it may be of interest to the present generation to know that I was the author. But the most notable of the characters whom I met was one Joseph Bell, surgeon at the Edinburgh Infirmary. Bell was a very remarkable man in body and mind. He was thin, wiry, dark, with a high-nosed acute face, penetrating grey eyes, angular shoulders, and a jerky way of walking. His voice was high and discordant. He was a very skilful surgeon, but his strong point was diagnosis, not only of disease, but of occupation and character. For some reason which I have never understood, he singled me out from the drove of students who frequented his wards, and made me his outpatient clerk, which meant that I had to array his outpatients, make simple notes of their cases, and then show them in, one by one, to the large room in which Bell sat in state, surrounded by his dressers and students. Then I had ample chance of studying his methods and of noticing that he often learned more of the patient by a few quick glances than I had done by my questions. Occasionally the results were very dramatic, though there were times when he blundered. In one of his best cases he said to a civilian patient, Well, my man, you've served in the army. I, sir. Not long discharged? No, sir. A Highland Regiment? Aye, sir. A non-com officer? Aye, sir. Stationed at Barbados? Aye, sir. You see, gentlemen, he would explain, the man was a respectful man but did not remove his hat. They do not in the army, but he would have learned civilian ways had he been long discharged. 
He has an air of authority, and he is obviously Scottish. As to Barbados, his complaint is elephantiasis, which is West Indian and not British. To his audience of Watsons it all seemed very miraculous, until it was explained, and then it became simple enough. It is no wonder that after the study of such a character I used and amplified his methods, when in later life I tried to build up a scientific detective who solved cases on his own merits, and not through the folly of the criminal. Bell took a keen interest in these detective tales, and even made suggestions which were not, I am bound to say, very practical. I kept in touch with him for many years, and he used to come upon my platform to support me when I contested Edinburgh in 1901. When I took over his outpatient work, he warned me that a knowledge of Scottish idioms was necessary, and I, with the confidence of youth, declared that I had got it. The sequel was amusing. On one of the first days an old man came who, in response to my question, declared that he had a bee in his oxter. This fairly beat me, much to Bell's amusement. It seems that the words really mean an abscess in the armpit. Speaking generally of my university career, I may say that though I took my fences in my stride and balked at none of them, still I won no distinction in the race. I was always one of the ruck, neither lingering nor gaining, a sixty per cent man at examinations. There were, however, some reasons for this which I will now state. It was clearly very needful that I should help financially as quickly as possible, even if my help only took the humble form of providing for my own keep. Therefore I endeavoured almost from the first to compress the classes for a year into half a year, and so to have some months in which to earn a little money as a medical assistant who would dispense and do odd jobs for a doctor. When I first set forth to do this, my services were so obviously worth nothing that I had to put that valuation upon them. Even then it might have been a hard bargain for the doctor, for I might have proved like the youth in Pickwick who had a rooted idea that oxalic acid was Epsom salts. However, I had horse sense enough to save myself and my employer from any absolute catastrophe. My first venture in the early summer of 78 was with a Dr Richardson running a low class practice in the poorer quarters of Sheffield. I did my best and I dare say he was patient, but at the end of three weeks we parted by mutual consent. I went on to London where I renewed my advertisements in the medical papers and found a refuge for some weeks with my Doyle relatives, then living at Clifton Gardens made of ale. I fear that I was too bohemian for them and they too conventional for me, However, they were kind to me, and I roamed about London for some time, with pockets so empty that there was little chance of idleness breeding its usual mischief. I remember that there were signs of trouble in the East, and that the recruiting sergeants, who were very busy in Trafalgar Square, took my measure in a moment, and were very insistent that I should take the shilling. There was a time when I was quite disposed to do so, but my mother's plans held me back. I may say that late in the same year I did volunteer as a dresser, for the English ambulances sent to Turkey for the Russian war, and was on the Red Cross list, but the collapse of the Turks prevented my going out. Soon, however, there came an answer to my advertisement. Third year's student, desiring experience, rather than remuneration, offers his services, etc., etc. It was from a Dr. Elliot living in a townlet in Shropshire, which rejoiced in the extraordinary name of Wrighton of the Eleven Towns. It was not big enough to make one town far less eleven. There, for four months, I helped in a country practice. It was a very quiet existence, and I had a good deal of time to myself, under very pleasant circumstances, so that I really traced some little mental progress to that period, for I read and thought without interruption. My medical duties were of a routine nature, save on a few occasions, one of them still stands out in my memory, for it was the first time in my life that I ever had to test my own nerve in a great sudden emergency. The doctor was out when there came a half-crazed messenger to say that in some rejoicings at a neighbouring great house had exploded an old cannon which had promptly burst and grievously injured one of the bystanders. No doctor was available, so I was the last resource. On arriving there I found a man in bed with a lump of iron sticking out of the side of his head. I tried not to show the alarm which I felt, and I did the obvious thing by pulling out the iron. 
I could see the clean white bone, so I could assure them that the brain had not been injured. I then pulled the gash together, staunched the bleeding, and finally bound it up, so that when the doctor did at last arrive, he had little to add. This incident gave me confidence, and what is more important still, gave others confidence. On the whole, I had a happy time at Ryden, and have a pleasing memory of Dr. Elliot and his wife. After a winter's work at the university, my next assistantship was a real money-making proposition to the extent of some two pounds a month. This was with Dr. Hoare, a well-known Birmingham doctor who had a five-horse city practice, and every working doctor, before the days of motors, would realise that this meant going from morning to night. He earned some three thousand a year, which takes some doing when it is collected from three and six visits, one and six bottles of medicine, among the very poorest classes of Aston. Hoare was a fine fellow, stout, square, red-faced, bushy-whiskered and dark-eyed. His wife was also a very kindly and gifted woman, and my position in the house was soon rather that of a son than of an assistant. The work, however, was hard and incessant, and the pay very small. I had long lists of prescriptions to make up every day, for we dispensed our own medicine, and one hundred bottles of an evening were not unknown. On the whole I made few mistakes, though I have been known to send out ointment and pill-boxes, with elaborate directions on the lid, and nothing inside. I had my own visiting list, also the poorest or the most convalescent, and I saw a great deal, for better or worse, a very low life. Twice I returned to this Birmingham practice, and always my relations with the family became closer. At my second visit my knowledge had greatly extended, and I did midwifery cases, and the more severe cases in general practice, as well as all the dispensing. I had no time to spend any money, and it was as well, for every shilling was needed at home. It was in this year that I first learned that shillings might be earned in other ways than by filling files. Some friend remarked to me that my letters were very vivid, and surely I could write some things to sell. I may say that the general aspiration towards literature was tremendously strong upon me, and that my mind was reaching out in what seemed an aimless way, in all sorts of directions. I used to be allowed tuppence for my lunch, that being the price of a mutton pie, but near the pie shop was a second-hand bookshop, with a barrel full of old books, and the legend, Your choice for two pence, stuck above it. Often the price of my luncheon used to be spent on some sample out of this barrel, and I have within reach of my arm, as I write these lines, copies of Gordon's Tacitus, Temple's Works, Pope's Homer, Addison's Spectator, and Swift's Works, which all came out of the tuppenny box. Anyone observing my actions and tastes would have said that so strong a spring would certainly overflow. But for my own part, I never dreamed I could myself produce decent prose, and the remark of my friend, who was by no means given to flattery, took me greatly by surprise. I sat down, however, and wrote a little adventure story which I called The Mystery of the Sasasa Valley. To my great joy and surprise, it was accepted by Chambers' journal, and I received three guineas. It mattered not that other attempts failed. I had done it once, and I cheered myself by the thought that I could do it again. It was years before I touched Chambers again, but in 1879 I had a story, The American's Tale, in London Society, for which also I got a small cheque. But the idea of real success was still far from my mind. During all this time our family affairs had taken no turn for the better, and had it not been for my excursions and for the work of my sisters, we could hardly have carried on. My father's health had utterly broken. He had to retire to that convalescent home in which the last years of his life were spent, and I, aged twenty, found myself practically the head of a large and struggling family. My father's life was full of the tragedy of unfulfilled powers and of undeveloped gifts. He had his weaknesses, as all of us have ours, but he had also some very remarkable and outstanding virtues. A tall man, long-bearded and elegant, he had a charm of manner and a courtesy of bearing which I have seldom seen equalled. His wit was quick and playful. He possessed also a remarkable delicacy of mind, which would give him moral courage enough to rise and leave any company which talked in a manner which was coarse. When he passed away a few years later, I am sure that Charles Doyle had no enemy in the world, 
and that those who knew him best sympathised most with the hard fate which had thrown him, a man of sensitive genius into an environment which neither his age nor his nature was fitted to face. He was unworldly and unpractical, and his family suffered for it, but even his faults were in some ways the result of his developed spirituality. He lived and died a fervent son of the Roman Catholic faith, my mother, however, who had never been a very devoted daughter of that great institution, became less so as life progressed, and finally found her chief consolation in the Anglican fold. This brings me to my own spiritual unfolding, if such it may be called, during those years of constant struggle. I have already in my account of the Jesuits shown how, even as a boy, all that was sanest and most generous in my nature rose up against a narrow theology and an uncharitable outlook upon the other great religions of the world. In the Catholic Church, to doubt anything is to doubt everything, for since it is a vital axiom that doubt is a mortal sin, when once it has, unbidden and unappeasable come upon you, everything is loosened, and you look upon the whole wonderful interdependent scheme with other and more critical eyes. Thus viewed, there was much to attract, its traditions, its unbroken and solemn ritual, the beauty and truth of many of its observances, its poetical appeal to the emotions, the sensual charm of music, light and incense, its power as an instrument of law and order. For the guidance of an unthinking and uneducated world, it could in many ways hardly be surpassed, as has been shown in Paraguay and in the former island where, outside agrarian trouble, crime was hardly known. All this I could clearly see, but if I may claim any outstanding characteristic in my life, it is that I have never paltered or compromised with religious matters, that I have always weighed them very seriously, and that there was something in me which made it absolutely impossible, even when my most immediate interests were concerned, to say anything about them save that which I, in the depth of my being, really believed to be true. Judging it thus by all the new knowledge which came to me, both from my reading and from my studies, I found that the foundations not only of Roman Catholicism, but of the whole Christian faith, as presented to me in nineteenth-century theology, were so weak that my mind could not build upon them. It is to be remembered that these were the years when Huxley, Tyndall, Darwin, Herbert Spencer and John Stuart Mill were our chief philosophers, and that even the man in the street felt the strong sweeping current of their thought, while to the young student, eager and impressionable, it was overwhelming. I know now that their negative attitude was even more mistaken, and very much more dangerous than the positive positions which they attacked with such destructive criticism. The gap had opened between our fathers and ourselves so suddenly and completely that when a Gladstone wrote to uphold the Gadarene swine or the six days of creation, the younger student rightly tittered over his arguments, and it did not need a Huxley to demolish them. I can see now very clearly how deplorable it is that manifest absurdities should be allowed to continue without even a footnote to soften them in the sacred text, because it has the effect that what is indeed sacred becomes overlaid, and one can easily be persuaded that what is false in parts can have no solid binding force. There are no worse enemies of true religion than those who clamour against all revisions or modification of that strange mass of superbly good and questionable matter, which we all lump together into a single volume, as if there were the same value to all of it. It is not solid gold, but gold in clay. And if this be understood, the earnest seeker will not cast it aside, when he comes upon the clay, but will value the gold the more, in that he has himself separated it. It was then all Christianity, and not Roman Catholicism alone, which had alienated my mind, and driven me to an agnosticism which never for an instant degenerated into atheism, for I had a very keen perception of the wonderful poise of the universe and the tremendous power of conception and sustenance which it implied. I was reverent in all my doubts, and never ceased to think upon the matter, but the more I thought, the more confirmed became my nonconformity. In a broad sense, I was a Unitarian, save that I regarded the Bible with more criticism than Unitarians usually show. This negative position was so firm that it seemed to me to be a terminus, 
whereas it proved only a junction on the road of life where I was destined to change from the old well-worn line onto a new one. Every materialist, as I can now clearly see, is a case of arrested development. He has cleared his ruins, but has not begun to build that which would shelter him. As to psychic knowledge, I knew it only by the account of exposures in the police courts and the usual wild and malicious statements in the public press. Years were to pass before I understood that in that direction might be found the positive proofs which I constantly asserted were the only conditions upon which I could resume any sort of allegiance to the unseen. I must have definite demonstration, for if it were to be a matter of faith, then I might as well go back to the faith of my father's. Never will I accept anything which cannot be proved to me. The evils of religion have all come from accepting things which cannot be proved. So I said at the time, and I have been true to my resolve. I would not give the impression that my life was gloomy or morbidly thoughtful because it chanced that I had some extra cares and some worrying thoughts. I had an eager nature which missed nothing in the way of fun, which could be gathered, and I had a great capacity for enjoyment. I read much. I played games all I could. I danced and I sampled the drama whenever I had a sixpence to carry me to the gallery. On one occasion I got into a row which might have been serious. I was waiting on the gallery steps with a great line of people, the shut door still facing us. There were half a dozen soldiers in the crowd, and one of these squeezed a girl up against a wall in such a way that she began to scream. As I was near them I asked the man to be more gentle, on which he dug his elbow with all his force into my ribs. He turned on me as he did so, and I hit him with both hands in the face. He bored into me and pushed me up into the angle of the door, but I had a grip of him and he could not hit me, though he tried to kick me in cowardly fashion with his knee. Several of his comrades threatened me, and one hit me on the head with his cane, cracking my hat. At this moment, luckily, the door opened, and the rush of the crowd carried the soldiers on, one sympathetic corporal saying, "'Take your breath, sir! Take your breath!' I threw my man through the open door and came home, for it was clearly asking for trouble if I remained. It was good escape from an awkward business, and now I come to the first real outstanding adventure in my life, which is worthy of a fresh chapter and of a more elaborate treatment. End of chapter 3